morning and good night uh, everyone this is update for may 10 2022 day 76 of the war end of the date update so we uh, as always gonna do first strategic a couple of strategic questions and we're gonna look at the russian economy russian uh, state finances and then also flow of natural gas from russia to europe through ukraine and then we're gonna do walk through the front line which is essentially static right now it's really world war one so for those who are really you know waiting for that there is no essentially there is no changes in the front line everything stays more or less stable stay, stays more or less the same since yesterday so there are no essential updates there so let's first talk a little bit of, now let's go back and talk about the strategic questions and let's look at what's going on with the russian economy specifically real economy so what we learned is that uh, auto sales fell by three times in russia since the beginning of the war and uh, also auto production essentially stopped with the exception of the manufacturing russian designed um, uh, automobile that's that nobody wants that's a very really poor quality so essentially um there is no production of uh, automobiles right, right now in Russia and uh, um, dealers, car dealers have uh, inventory of about two to five months of cars at the current pace of sale. So essentially there, is, there will be huge shortage of cars in Russia in about two to five months. And, uh, but the sales also fell th uh, three times. In addition, the production of home appliances and specifically washing machine and refrigerators fell by two times so as you can this is this gives us good feeling about what's happening to russian economy so when we see projections that russian gdp will fall by 10 percent we believe that that's not going to be it's going to be much more than 10 percent it's probably not going to be half because this is just a small subset, it's industrial production. Uh, but at the same time, it's the most, it's where the most of the value is added in the economy. So that's going to be, uh, eventually this going to hit um, Russian state finances pretty hard. But uh, at this moment, Russian state finances are in uh, perfect order and more than perfect. A Russian budget surplus for the first four months of this year was uh, eight to ten billion, uh, billion U.S. dollars, and eight to ten we're saying eight to ten. We're giving a range because the exchange rate, the, depending which exchange rate you use, and there is essentially no uh, free market for um, buying and selling Russian currency right now, so it's. It's hard to even put the you know number in U.S. dollars or euros, but it it just tells us that this is huge. Um, um, this is the, the run run rate for the year. That really means that they have that the Russian budget has a surplus of about thirty to forty billion U.S. dollars. In addition, Russian trade surplus was also something like fifty eight uh, billion U.S. dollars. So as you can see right now, Russian uh, state finances look in uh, perfect condition and let's say stellar condition. However, based on what we said about the real economy just a uh, few minutes ago, essentially this real economy will sink Russian state finances because that will eventually hit very hard in terms of tax revenue and so on. And uh, but for now, it does seem that Russian state finances have two to five months at least uh, of time before things will get somewhat bad there. Then uh, let's now, and then it uh, hope may be related to this, is there is a news in Russia that four governors of various regions in Russia quit today. And the most, uh, the most significant, most important uh, region is Saratov, which is a relatively uh, big economic powerhouse in Russia. Not the biggest one for sure, but it's a, one of the major ones. 
So that really tells us that things, there is something going on inside, uh, under the surface, in the Russian sort of politics and in Russian uh, power system. Uh, then there is another piece of important economic uh, news uh, that's more related to Ukraine. So there is a uh, natural gas pipeline, actually several of them, that go through Ukraine to Europe from Russia, obviously. They were built in a, during Soviet time. And nominal capacity that Ukraine can transport and used to transport is uh, between 100 to 120 uh, cubic meters of natural gas per year. It, based on what the numbers we have seen in January and February of this year, uh, throughput dropped to about 18 to 19 a billion cubic meters per year. This is on per year um, uh, cycle. We're looking at this, not per day. So, so that's what was going on through Ukraine to Europe. Now, the Russian uh, forces captured in Luhansk region one of the compressor station, and because of that, Ukrainian Natural Gas Transportation Authority refused to continue transportation through that compression station. So essentially that really what this really means in simple terms is that about a third of the throughput of natural gas through Ukraine that goes to Europe uh, will, will not go anymore starting tomorrow, uh, which is uh, essentially this tomorrow, May 11. So that really means that about 6 billion uh, cubic meters of natural gas will not be coming to Europe on if we on annualized basis. Just for reference, the, this this means that the, this is consumption of natural gas, annual consumption of natural gas of such country as Portugal. Well, it's not huge, but it certainly puts additional pressure on European natural gas market. In you know the. This most simplistic assumption of the natural gas prices in Europe will go uh, more even further. We don't know how much, but that's just our uh, assumption. Um, now we finished the sort of strategic situation. Let's actually look and uh, let's do walk through the front line. We're gonna start. We're gonna do it in clockwise fashion, and we're gonna start uh, with Kharkiv. So let's see. Uh, first of all, uh, there is a date. Uh, we're learning that the 10, uh, Ukrainian 10th Brigade has been moved to Kharkiv region. We don't know exactly where it is. Either it's straight east of Kharkiv or it's actually here near Izum. So more likely than not, it's, that it's probably somewhere near Izum, a situation there difficult for Ukrainian side. And it's actually difficult for the Russian side as well at this point given there are no new fresh troops there. But uh, let's let's start with um, walks through. Let's look what's going on uh, immediately east of Kharkiv. So situation here is stable, nothing new. Again, there is uh, Russian side claims that they control village of Litsi. Uh, we, we don't know, we don't have any confirmation. So for now, we'll leave it as, as, as it is, as it we based on their original information we had but it's possible that they control or it's just gray zone but eventually as we discussed before ukrainian troops will squeeze this uh, small russian buffer towards their state border and they will regain control of this area eventually so the otherwise situation here is stable there is nothing really new to report here let's now look and let's look at the let's move towards south we're going to look at izum bridgehead which is one of the most important sections of the front line because this is a part where russia is still trying to actively attack at this point because essentially russia switched to sort of call it strategic defense pretty much everywhere with the exception of the zoom bridgehead uh, this tip of the salient and south, you know, you know, called the southern 
sort of uh, section of the front line that's um, we call it the bridge front line here in this area so that's essentially a, the only areas where the russian side is uh, truly active uh, everywhere else it's on defensive position there is you know uh, uh, sort of probing attacks and uh, active shelling uh, of each other and you know it's a world war one basically right so but there is no real movements on the real no real attempts to do uh, offense you know attacks or true offenses and and so on so uh, let's uh, let's look here situation is basically stable there's nothing new ukrainian side the only sort of not like new but that's just what we uh, saw is that ukrainian uh, artillery shelled extremely heavily village of zavody and hit some of the russian troops there but this is just because it's a known fact otherwise we're pretty sure the same happening across everywhere here on the bridgehead and obviously in the, in the direction of ukrainian side as well then if we look at Liman bridgehead there's no news here again probably positional fighting no new advances by the russian side as we you know discussed before russian side is slowly squeezing out from this bridgehead ukrainian side however that's squeeze has stopped and probably for three or four days the front line here was more or less stable now let's keep going and we're gonna look at the tip of the Donbass salient and specifically area uh, around around Severodonetsk and and then we're gonna look at the Papasna so this is essentially forms kind of like another smaller salient that at this point Russian side tried to cut off or essentially encircle ukrainian troops there so let's see what's going on there uh, there is nothing new with the exception that it does look like the russian bridgehead is still like semi-destroyed but not completely wiped out so there are still some russian troops in bilohorivka and they're still defending based on our information it's less than the company size so the bridge is still destroyed but apparently um, the remaining russian troops continue resistance in this village and obviously russian artillery helps them tremendously because it's you know it's the distance is less than five kilometers so the precision of the artillery is pretty high plus we discussed that the russian artillery is better at this point than ukrainian because it has this embedded uh, UAV, uh, UAV um, uh, groups or uh, companies uh, equipped with Arlan 10 that allows to correct or adjust artillery fire and be pretty precise uh, given that in general that artillery is not precise um, so otherwise that's only a dangerous situation but for now as long as the bridge is blown up there is no chance that the Russian side can exploit this bridgehead. So for now, it's kind of like plugged and situation semi-stable. It's not perfect, far from perfect. Because the idea from, and we're just going to remind for those who are new, the idea of Russian side was, you know, establish bridgehead here and then push towards north and then attack from Popasna towards sorry push towards south and then attack from Popasna towards north or another attempt was to attack from you know through Toshkivka towards north or through Orihove and then Yuskea towards north so basically create some kind of like a pocket you know whatever sort of sort of pursue parts pass of least resistance and try you know and but the, the whole goal is to create a pocket and the more the specific goal of this pocket is to force ukrainian troops to withdraw from severodonetsk and lysychansk which would be super difficult to assault and it would lead to a lot of casualties on the russian side similar to the large number of casualties when during the uh, fight for rubizhne and during the fight for Popasna. and since this um, 
towns are much larger, so the number of casualties will be much higher. And we're not saying that Ukrainian side did not have casualties, they obviously did, but attacking force always has much higher casualties and defending in in the city, in, in urban area is much easier than defending in the open field. So this would give Ukrainian side advantage and you know, Russian side wants to uh, kind of force the hand of Ukrainian side and make them withdraw towards West so that then there is no need to fight for this town. So that's the whole point of this this small kind of attempt to create this smaller pocket here in this area. But so far, situation is looking stable. Uh, Russian side did not make any progress in Toshkivka. Uh, they, based on our information, they almost captured this village of Arikhove. And there is nothing new around Popasna. And the bridge is blown up. So and there's just essentially company, comp less than the company size of Russian troops. So there's no way that they can you know, make any kind of encirclement. So the situation here is difficult, but stable so far. So now this is, we're just going to look a little bit towards the south of Popasna, just kind of show the front line here. Nothing really truly kind of like, you know, important here towards the south. We just managed to um, sort of establish it, like to understand where it goes. So we just want to share it with you. Oh, in addition, we also spotted that Russian uh, 40, uh, 40th Naval Infantry Brigade is operating in Papasna. Uh, so there's quite a bit of troops here, and that's probably a reason why they managed to um, to capture it. So, and we obviously don't know everything, right? There's probably more Russian units operating here that we have not uh, we have not managed to establish so far. So now we're gonna go toward more towards south. We're gonna look uh, uh, at the front line straight west of Donetsk. Let's see what's going on there. So uh, really nothing new. Russia can, Russian forces continue their attempts to expand the salient. But so far, no success there. Again, attacks on Avdiivka, attacks on Marinka, attacks on Novomikhailivka, uh, attacks here on Pavlivka with the idea of, uh, of the with the end goal Vuhodar, but nothing, no changes to the front line. Everything more or less stable. So the front line here holds the way it used to be yesterday. So then uh, we now we're gonna look at this. Uh, front of this um, what we call the Parisia front line and specifically we're going to focus more on the eastern section of the Zaporizhia front line because that's more critical that's where Russian side is trying to create southern pincer of the larger encirclement that they attempting to do and uh, trying to ens encircle uh, all of the Ukrainian troops here in the bus salient that's what we call the bus salient here so let's look what's going on here. Again, there is nothing new based on our information. There are attacks on Pav on Pavlivka, as we discussed before, but that's uh, more, you know, trying to kind of like just put the pressure on the Ukrainian side here. Uh, otherwise, the front line is stable, as we discussed. We believe because this is due to the fact that Ukrainian side brought in here 128th Brigade and Azoki Regiment that allowed them to stabilize front line here. So for now, everything's stable here. Um, and then then this is the bigger picture look uh, at the same front line. So now you see the whole stretch uh, from Kaminske to Velika Novosilka. And as we mentioned before, the key four, four key strongholds are uh, town of Kaminske, Arikhiv, Ulaipole, and Velika Novosilka. So uh, now let's keep going towards west. Let's see what's going on here on Kherson bridgehead. And as we discussed before, it's everything is stable here, just uh, active shelling. Uh, we've seen reports of uh, extremely heavy shelling of Mikolaev in the area around this, you know, here. Um, but beyond that, there is no, no real, like no like full scale attacks otherwise. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks for watching and until tomorrow. Bye-bye.